Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for another webcast in our Civic Education Series. This project is a joint venture involving the Congressional Youth Leadership Council, the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress, and the Lou Fry Institute at the University of Central Florida. My name is John Cool, and I'm going to be moderating today's conversation with two former members of Congress. We'll be focusing on Congress and the budget, specifically how the budget is formed, the process of passing the budget, and what happens if the Congress and the President can't agree on the budget. To help us explore this subject, we'll be pleased, we are pleased to be joined by Congressman John Tanner, a Democrat from Tennessee, and Congressman Bill Zeliff, a Republican from New Hampshire. They will field questions from a live studio audience comprised of high school students who are in Washington, D.C. as part of the National Young Leaders Conference. Before we open the floor to questions, why don't we give each of our two panelists a chance to quickly introduce themselves. Uh, Congressman Tanner, we'll begin with you. Well, thank you very much, John. I'm delighted to be here. I am uh, from Tennessee. Uh, rep our district was the western part of the state in the middle, basically between Nashville and uh, Memphis. Um, I served 22 years. I was on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee, and before that on uh, Science and Technology and Armed Services Committee. So during the time I was there, I served on four different committees, which uh, uh, gives one uh, an interesting perspective uh, from that standpoint. And I'm delighted to see young people here today. We uh, always tried to see them uh, when they came to Washington. This is a good group. It's a Young Leaders Conference that I'm familiar with. Uh, and by the way, I was asked earlier, uh, my district was once represented by David Crockett. Oh, okay. For people who remember David Crockett in the coon skin cap. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, Bill Zeliff, and I'm from New Hampshire. Um, I uh, got elected in 1990 and uh, served till 96, um, three terms. And I was uh, national. I was chairman of National Security Oversight. Uh, I was on the Small Business Committee. I owned. I was a small businessman. Um, and we also were uh, served on the Transportation Committee. Um, it's a great privilege to be with all of you, and I know that you've had some interesting discussions this week, and you're learning a lot about our government, but even more important, you're learning about uh, life in general and some of the issues that, that we're all dealing with. And it's, it's, I imagine it's got, a, got to have been a very interesting week. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is really the perfect time to be having this budget discussion. We've got the continuing resolution, so until April 8th, we'll, we'll see what happens. We're right in the, the heat of it now. Uh, why don't we take our first question? Hi, my name is Jacob, and I'm from Louisiana. My question is, uh, will you explain the areas of spending in the budget, and what percentage of the budget do those areas make up? Okay, so what do we spend our money on? Well, uh, Basically, um, you take your discretionary uh, piece, which is about 40%, um, and that includes uh, the military and non-military. Uh, it's basically the cost of running government. And then the, the entitlements is about 60%, and that also includes the cost of, of the debt. And uh, the problem that we're facing right now is if you take that 60%, that's grown. It used to be reversed. So the entitlements is basically taken over all the resources. Eventually, we're not going to have enough money left to do the um, to, to do this, the uh, discretionary. Uh, our big problem right now: 41 percent of what we spend, our budget, our total budget is 3.5 trillion. 41 percent of that is borrowed money. So that's the trap that we're getting ourselves into. So we really need, and I hope they will be looking at this this month, uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, everything on the table, finding a way to have a path so that in the next two years, the next 10 years, excuse me, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be on top of this. And it's just like if John and I were in our kitchen, you know, we're piling up the bills that we can afford to pay and those that then we can't pay, we gotta go out and borrow, borrow from a bank or someplace and at what point do we get that avenue shut off for us? So we're in very serious trouble. And, and what do you explain what entitlements are? Entitlements are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and uh, an assortment of other things like food stamps and, and all that. 
Um, and so you're, you're really dealing, you know, I mean, 3.5 trillion sounds like a big number, but if you just put $350 and then just reduce those, half of it is going to be the, the well, 60% entitlements, 40%. Um, on the discretionary, and you just look at the debt that is just piling up. And the, the sad thing, John and I are not going to have to deal with that. You guys are, and our kids and our grandchildren. And it's a, it's a terrible legacy for us to have left. left. Do you want to hear anything? Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, interest on the debt, and national defense consume almost 80% of the revenue. And so when we talk about cutting spending, if all they're talking about is cutting out of the 15 or the 19 percent, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to get back to balance. There's just simply not enough there in discretionary domestic spending to cut to get back to where we need to be. Uh, the last time we were in balance was late 90s in the year 2000. At that time, revenue and expenditure were both around 19% of GDP. We are breaking even, basically. Well, we did some things that we probably couldn't afford at the time not knowing. The second worst thing that happened, in my view, in 2001, 9-11, of course, being the worst, what happened in February when the Congressional Budget Office forecast there'd be a $5 trillion surplus over the next 10 years, and people treated it as if it were money when it was a forecast. I remember at the time saying, look, there's no money here. We're barely breaking even, and who can tell what's going to happen over the next 10 years? I don't know what the price of cotton's going to be in 10 days. Uh, this is a forecast. It's supposed to be 75 and sunny tomorrow, and you wake up and it's 40 and rainy, and you don't put on flip-flops, shorts, and sunglasses and go for a walk. Well, you know what happened uh, uh, then? We, we uh, embarked on a, an economic plan for the country, resulting by 2003, revenue was below 17 percent of GDP and expenditures were over 20. And we've had what I call a structural deficit. Uh, this entire decade. And, and I would just add one thing. The, the expenditures now are 24 percent, and the revenue is down around 16 15 or 15 and a half percent. Or so all that stuff in between, 9 percent, is the debt, and that's where finance, we're financing that debt. We're borrowing money. So if you're sitting in your kitchen table, you wouldn't be doing this. And it's, it's about time that we stop kicking the can down the road and we deal with it. Because if we don't do it now, we're going to lose the opportunity to do it, and we will be, unfortunately, uh, not the country that we are today. All right. Thank you. Next Thank you. question. What is best for a budget, bipartisanship or a one-sided budget? If you could please explain. So is it good when, when the two parties work together or if one side just kind of steamrolls it through? Well, I, I think, I hate to admit this, and I don't know how John feels about it, but I think divided government probably is good, especially now, uh, because um, I've seen it under, I've been in the minority and I've been in the majority and you've been both, and I got news for you. There's no, no neither party uh, can really stand, I don't think, can stand up and said, you know, they, they've, they've created this mess on both sides. And uh, it's not one or the other. But the biggest thing, if you look at it from the 1990s on, we, we could have had a time when we had tremendous surpluses. And I can remember them talking about the surpluses being bad. I can really remember that. I mean, it's so stupid. But that's when the growth of government just absolutely mushroomed, and and uh, and that's where we started spending money out of uh, money that we didn't have. So compromise, not a bad word. No, it's the way this country was uh, formed. There's a reason. There's two senators from New Hampshire, or Rhode Island, and two from California and New York. It's called compromise right. because uh, they they had to do that. What uh, Bill's right. It'd be better. 
it's better policy when you can get agreement, bipartisan agreement on almost anything. Any lasting program in this country, if you look back, was passed on a bipartisan basis. Uh, I, one of the problems that we have in this country today is this rancor and inability of some to extend to one who disagrees with them on a public policy matter the same intellectual honesty and purity of motive they claim for themselves. And one of the reasons I think that we've reached this point is uh, something called gerrymandering. Uh, there was a case in uh, 1962 in the Supreme Court called Baker versus Carr. Uh, Carr Baker was a guy from uh, my district in Tennessee because at that time, Memphis, Tennessee, had almost a fourth of the people in the state and had three representatives in the state legislature out of 99. And he brought a case because he was on the county commission in Memphis and, uh, and said, this is not fair. And the Supreme Court in that case in 1962, first time in modern history, said, this is a justiciable issue. We do have jurisdiction up until that time Basically, what they had said was that's a legislative uh, function. We're judicial separation of powers, blah, blah, blah. Well, what happened then is when they said you have to have the same number of people in primarily state house, state senate, and U.S. house seats, they turned it over to the ends. Well, it took those folks back that were the ends back in those days, about five minutes, to figure out this was a good deal for incumbents. He's a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I give him all my Demo uh, Dem uh, Republicans, he gives me all his Democrats, and we both have a safe seat. Forty-eight years later, there are only 91 seats out of 435 in the House that are within the hypothetical margin of error of a 50-50 voting pattern, which means over 300 members are elected, again, theoretically, by the most partisan elements of our society those who reside in the party primaries exclusively. Uh, Billy said it best, uh, they're, they're, neither party has a monopoly on wisdom and virtue in this deal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what you have is members elected from these very partisanly drawn districts for incumbent protection, and they come here, they're good people, but they come here really with an inability politically sometimes to go into the middle and try to figure out how, to, how we move the country ahead because if they do, they'll be accused of not being ideologically pure enough or cavorting with the enemy or God knows what. And that has paralyzed, in my view, uh, the House to some degree to move into uh, a common goal as Americans first, not as Democrats or Republicans. I just uh, add one thing. This week or next couple of weeks before the a April 8th, uh, you're going to see what we're all made of, I think. Uh, you'll see leadership come out, I hope, of both parties. Uh, I hope that the president uh, joins the, and I think he will, uh, in the end. There's going to be a little bit of... Uh, Staging, um, I think, when when you go before people agree to increase the debt limit, they're going to want to get something for it, and and so it's I, I can't believe that we'd even think of closing down government. I don't think that's in the cards, but it, I do believe that at some point everybody will come together. I really believe that, and for the best interest of the country, and uh, and it, and to me, if that happens. Um, it'll be the best thing that ever could have happened in any of our lives. Well, I would maybe not go that far, but, but it's, it's something that has to happen. All right, thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Kara from New Jersey, and I was wondering, how do you take into consideration demographic changes that could affect the budget, um, specifically the baby boomers that will put a strain on the welfare in the coming years? Go ahead. Uh, I used to chair the Social Security subcommittee, and the baby boomers that you mentioned are all coming of age as it relates to Social Security. Uh, Social Security uh, is and never was uh, intended to be an actuarially sound pension system. What uh, Social Security was was an uh, old age uh, supplemental 
uh, to keep people from uh, hopefully falling into poverty in their elderly years. And there's been a lot added to the Social Security umbrella through the years, uh, survivor benefits uh, for children of uh, people who are deceased was not a part of the original Social Security law. Some of the disability programs were not part of the original. And so when Social Security actuarially is a, a problem, I would suggest it is a mere tropical breeze compared to Medicare. Uh, that's a Hurricane 5, uh, Category 5 hurricane three miles offshore coming our way because most of the baby boomers, as they get older, require more and more medical attention and, uh, and resources. And so, uh, I th hopefully, uh, the uh, Congress uh, there now can make improvements to uh, the health care bill uh, in terms of uh, controlling costs. That's where you have to go, as I said earlier, right. uh, you, you can't balance the budget by just cutting discretionary spending. You could cut it all and you still can't balance the budget. You're going to have to get into some of these issues where they're exploding cost. Right. And on your, you, you touched base a little bit on the health care bill. Things like tort reform, all, everything's got to be on the table. We can make it a better bill. Um, and when it gets to the entitlements piece, the baby boomers are coming to a point where they're going to be drawing down Social Security and, and benefits and, and Medicare. Um, if you look at that shift going from 40% to 60%, for the entitlements, it's going to keep growing, and it's going to the, the, the trend line is 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 going to be a disaster. So we got to take a look at the whole program, top to bottom, and we've got to look at all our programs. We got to go back to that baseline in 1990, and where we had the explosion, we've got to take a look at the programs that are no longer worthy of us funding, and we we just they're they're all on remote control, and we've got to we've got to take the time, and from an A to Z point of view. Look at everything. Put it all on the table. Evaluate it. Yeah. Uh, switching out of some process questions. Why don't we go to our next question? Hi, I'm Daniela from New Jersey. And um, does passing a budget go through the same process as passing a bill? So, what's the actual process? How does it? How does it become law? Well, the the budget itself. Uh, when we when we asked the president to send his budget over in February. Um, that is a legislative prerogative decision. We, we hold the, we, we can't say we anymore, but Congress uh, holds the purse uh, of, and has the purse strings. Um, but the, the president sends over budget, kind of gives a direction of what his plans are. Congress can either accept that or, or add to it or make it better or reject it. Uh, Congress is responsible for it. And it goes through a process where you you take and uh, your budget committees set the the limits or the goals or the guidelines for each of the uh, appropriations committees, and then they have to work their will and work their way, and then eventually we get a chance to, to they get a chance to vote on it. And um, uh, yeah, the, what would you the the budget it, it doesn't have the force of law. It is a blueprint for spending that's done through. Theoretically, the appropriations process when uh, when uh, the bill is presented. So, the it, it, the same process doesn't apply to the budget that does apply to a bill. In answer to your question, um, do do members of Congress look forward to the budget process, or is it something that they they kind of dread? <laughs> I I tell you, last year they didn't do they didn't pass one bill. One, I mean, they should be ashamed, and 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 we eventually have gotten to the point where it's gotten broken. It's really broken bad, and so we have to fix it. And the way, the only way that I know that we can honestly fix it, is go back to a 1990 baseline and do a kind of a BRAC process in the Senate and the House, and we put we put some responsible people together, and they co and they they re review all of these programs. That have uh, that are no longer should be supported. Take a look at what was appropriated, and and uh, versus w what was um, approved in terms of legislative intent, 
and there's a lot of junk in there and a lot of stuff that no longer applies that we shouldn't be supporting. And it's enough probably to come close to really getting our, getting our act back together. But this thing is really broken, and it is, an, it is a shame, and it's a mess. All right, we've got about 10, 10 minutes left. Next question. What role do lobbyists have in the budget-making process, and how do lobbyists affect earmarks? Well, I, I, the budget process, is, uh, as Bill suggested, is broken. It has become a political document more than a real legislative document. Uh, the, in fact, it's uh, almost uh, routine if the budget uh, provides X number of dollars for X function to just simply waive it when you get on the floor by, by uh, a bill to, uh, in the rule where you, you only have to pass a rule by 50 plus one percent to waive a two-thirds majority. It's the only place <laughs> I know that that uh, work, and I've always tried to figure out how you'd explain that to uh, uh, Robert's Rules of Order class. But anyway, it happens. Uh, the, the lobbyists uh, can serve a very useful purpose if what they do is impart information. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a, a medical doctor, I'm not a, and so you have to go to someone who has expertise in that field, say, what's, what's the story? And so I think there's a connotation about lobbyists that maybe is uh, skewed to some degree. Good lobbyists will tell you both sides. This is where we are here, this is who's against, this is why they get, so you get some information. As long as lobbyists are imparting information, uh, then they serve, in my view, a function. Uh, Bill, you got yeah, I, I would only say this. All of you have been lobbyists in your life. You may not admit to that. Um, you, you are behind a project, uh, might be wanting to get a car for your mom and dad, you know, for a prom. Uh, so you work your deal. You work your dad. You work your mom. You're being a lobbyist. You, you really are. You're getting behind a project. You bring information. And ultimately, there's a decision maker. And it's either your mom or dad or both. In our situation, uh, I mean, th the only difference between you doing that and me doing what I do is I get paid for it. <laughs> and ultimately, in the end, we both be in a position. We're in the chair that had to make the decision. You had to abide by that decision. You get the best information together, you make your decision, and you live with it. You could get thrown out of office because you make bad decisions, and people do happen. That, uh, it does happen. So it, it's, it's an interest. I don't think lobbyists have anything to do with the budget, but when it comes to the process of what gets funded and what doesn't get funded, then you have that process where you, you lobby the, the office that has the bill and the committee. Thank you. Next question. I'm Felicia from California, and I was wondering how does the ongoing economic recession affect the formation of the federal budget today? That's a very good question. Um, probably not that much. Uh, the, again, the budget is a blueprint or a, a, a guideline uh, to, to uh, real policy making that happens in the committees of uh, jurisdiction. Uh, no question there is pressure to cut spending because of the recession. There ought to be pressure to cut spending uh, all anyway. the time anyway. Uh, I'm afraid that we are going to have to uh, look at more revenue. And I say that because the government as we know it that we've come to expect to have a strong military to defend us against uh, uh, something all of the other things the infrastructure if you look at uh, countries around the world where there's no infrastructure nobody's making any money it's not a, you can't make money on a dirt road with no water sewer electricity and a, no bridge over the creek to get to your place of business and so infrastructure investment has to, in my view, continue. And the other thing that, uh, if you read history, you find, in my case, uh, uh, what I find is 
that no country can remain strong and free with an unhealthy, uneducated population. It's just not possible to have a dumb, unhealthy, sick country of people and be strong and free. And so I call it human capital investment and infrastructure investment, has, and plus our defense and, and so forth, has to be part of the mix. Historically, over the last 50 years, the revenue stream's been around 18.5% of GDP. Uh, now, we might could get along a little less, but we can't pr provide the services, in my view, as a nation to the people of this country at 14 or 15 percent of GDP. Now, when you talk about that, well, hey, that guy wants to raise taxes. I would put it another way. No, this guy wants to balance the budget. And in order, as Billy said earlier, to balance a budget, you have to have everything on the table, all of the expenditures plus all the revenues. Then you can try to get to some point where you can break even. I'd like to see us take a look at this $1.6 trillion worth of tax breaks. I'd like to see us change that and take a look at every one of those and eliminate most of them. I'd like to see us look at a flat tax, look at a fair tax. Our, our tax system is broken. So that's another thing that ought to be on the table. And, and uh, I, I, I want to add one thing that you said on infrastructure. Um, I believe that we ought to add the 15 cent uh, gas tax to, to our gas fund because the gas fund's broke. And we can't afford to have an infrastructure that's falling down, the bridges are breaking down, the highways can't be fixed, we can't do trains, we can't do this, we can't do that. It's crazy. So I, I, I agree, uh, I think, on most everything you said, if not all. But adding a couple things to it, I, I just think uh, there's a way out of what we need to do, and, it, and it's going to take some pain, um, and it's going to take a lot of sacrifice, but we can do it, and, and we will be strong as a country if we do. Okay. We've got about three minutes left. I'm going to go to our next question. Hi, I'm Zach from California, and you did touch on it a little bit earlier, but uh, how do you guys know how much money you guys are going to get for your budget for the next year? And how do you decide uh, how to allot it? How do you decide what gets the 60%, what gets the 40%? How does that? It's, it's a million assumptions. Um, and getting back to what happened in 2000, all of the assumptions that went into the conclusion there'd be this huge surplus over the next 10 years, 9-11 uh, changed virtually every assumption, but the Congress didn't do anything to change course, and so we got into this structural deficit where the revenue is somewhere around 15, 16 percent of GDP and expenditure is over 20. Now, uh, some, you, you do, you, they make the best forecasts they can. I don't know how anybody can go much beyond a year, maybe two at the most, in terms of uh, the performance of the economy of the United States. You don't know, for example, war, natural disasters. I mean, Lord knows, I hope it doesn't happen here, but if something happened to the magnitude that happened to Japan, it would destroy our economy in that part of the world for an extended period of time, which means your revenues would drop precipitously. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a guess, it's a guesstimate, but it is a, I think an informed. Uh, it's not just pulling numbers That's out. That's a here. CBO yeah, kind of thing, yeah. and they give us the best that they can, both in revenues and and you take a look at your expenses, and and then you, it's, it's a it's a congressional overall decision to move ahead on the numbers. I think, right? R real quick, because we've got less than a minute left. Yeah. Uh, something you mentioned before is a shutdown. What what is the, What's the shutdown, and what would that look like if it happened? I was through the last shutdown. I guess you were too. Yeah, well. And uh, I, I don't think it's anything we should do or want to do. I know Jay, John Boehner, and I think he's uh, going to be a great speaker and is a great speaker. Um, and I know uh, I know Democratic leaders as well. And nobody wants to shut the government down. I don't think there may be posturing and and all that. And I'm just hopeful that. Uh, at the end of the day that we don't go that route and we we address this thing and work together the thing that I feel good about is the group of six senators that are working so hard right now to revamp a little bit about the Commission's a lot of their recommendations 
And uh, I, I think that there's over 80% of the people in the U.S. Senate that are agreed that we've got a real serious problem. And I think, that we're, I think it's starting to come together. I hope it will. All right, good. We'll leave it right there. Uh, that's unfortunately all the, the time we have for today. Thank you very much for tuning in. I also want to thank our two panelists for sharing their time and expertise with us, uh, Congressman Tanner and Congressman thank Zell. Thank you both so much. Uh, we also want to thank our studio audience, the uh, students from the National Young Leaders Conference who gave us some great questions today, so thank you to you. Um, we hope you found our conversation interesting and very timely with the budget process, and we hope you'll join us again when we continue our series in the summer. Until then, thank you and goodbye.